Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. In this video, I'm going to finish up my lesson one notes that I started on Friday. Um, we're going to talk about how to find intersection points between two parametrically defined curves, and we're also going to start talking about how to plot surfaces in three-dimensional space. Uh, let's start with intersections. So what I have here are two parametrically defined curves, L1 of t and L2 of t, and I want to find out, do these two curves intersect? And if so, where is that point of intersection? Now, um, my main piece of advice would be if you have technology available to you on a particular problem, the best thing to do would be to start with a plot. So I went into Mathematica and I plotted out these two curves. I found out that they're both linear equations. They're both straight lines. And it does appear that we do have an intersection point. Now, this is a fairly simple problem where we actually uh, the intersection point is happening at uh, integer coordinates. So you actually could just count on the graph and find out where that intersection point is. But of course, looking forward, you could see much more complicated parametric curves in the future, parametrically defined curves in the future, uh, in which case you would need to make sure that you know an algebraic technique where you can find the intersection point even if it's not at a pair of integers. So here's the technique. We're going to set up a system of equations as follows. We're going to write L1 of t is equal to L2 of s. Now the common sense idea behind this is that the blue curve is traced out by a particle moving along this line over time, and the orange curve is also traced out by a particle moving along this orange line over time. And what will happen is um, we do expect these two curves, this locus of points for each equation to intersect, but we don't necessarily expect the particles to collide. What I mean by that is each particle traces out the respective line here, um, and we do have an intersection point, but that doesn't mean that the particles from each parametrically defined line are at the same point at the same time, and that's what this algebraic setup acknowledges, that L1 of t and L2 of s these two lines should intersect, but it's possible that that intersection points, point uh, is achieved at a different time on L1 than it is achieved on L2. I can give you guys a little bit of a uh, visual that illustrates that point. So I wrote a little bit of Mathematica code here. Let me see if I can get this up and running. There we go. Okay, I'm going to press pl uh, play on this. These are the two lines that we see in the PowerPoint slide. And when I press play, what you're going to see is that each of these lines are being traced out by a particle, but this intersection point here is being hit by the particle at different times. So there is uh, the two lines are at the same point in space, but the particle gets there at different times. And again, that's what our algebraic setup is doing for us. It's allowing us to find when the two particles are at the same place, but at different times. Um, okay, so now that we have that t and that s plugged in here, I'm going to take the equation for L1 of t. Here it is. Now, I'm also going to take the equation for L2 of t. But instead of plugging in t's, I'm going to plug in s's. Now, this gives me a system of equations. I can thread this out as two separate equations. So the first equation would be the x-coordinate of the left side set equal to the x-coordinate of the right side. That gives me 5 minus t equals s plus 3. I could do the same thing with the y-coordinates. So I could take the y-coordinate of the left side, set it equal to the y-coordinate of the right side, and that gives me t plus 6 is equal to s minus 4. Now we just have a, a system of equations. So get all of your s's and t's to one side of the equation, get all your constants to the right side of the equation. You can do that for both equations. And now it's something you, could, you guys could have solved in junior high because now it's just uh, elimination or substitution. We have um, s plus t is equal to two and s minus t is equal to 10. And you could just set up a system here. You could take your s plus t equal to 2, stack it on top of your s minus t is equal to 10, and you could do elimination there. You get 2s is equal to 12, and if 2s is equal to 12, 
and of course s is equal to 6. That's your first solution. And then to solve for t, you just plug it, plug back in and do the exact same thing. And you could get t is equal to negative 4. And this gives us evidence that the two curves do in fact intersect, but the particle that traces out each curve gets there at a different time. Now, um, we want to find the actual algebraic coordinates of that intersection. All you have to do is go ahead and plug in either your t equals negative 4 into L1, and you get 9 comma 2, or you could take your s equals 6 and plug it into L2, and again you get 9 comma 2. I did both uh, calculations there. Um, you wouldn't have to do both unless you're trying to check your work. I just want to illustrate that either option works, uh, but you're not locked into uh, one or the other. You could do both. You could pick one or the other. It doesn't matter. All right, so now let's talk about another possible setup that a lot of students find uh, intuitive, but turns out to not give you what you would expect. So a lot of students, I've taught this class long enough to know that a lot of students want to set up this equation, L1 of t equals L2 of t. Now there's nothing um, intrinsically wrong about setting up that equation. It's just not finding what you want it to find. So instead of finding an intersection between the two curves, that setup is asking, do the two particles reach the same point in space at the exact same time? Same point in space at the same time. And as you guys can see from this little demonstration I made, that doesn't happen. You don't have the uh, red particle and the blue particle reaching that intersection point at the same time. They both get there, but in their own, you know, in their, on their own schedule, essentially. So uh, here's some Mathematica code that you guys can compute. Um, obviously, uh, at this point, you may or may not be comfortable with this, but if you, once you have access to Mathematica um, and plug this into the system and shift enter, you'll get an output for each of these blocks of codes, blocks of code, and you can compare what you get and get a pretty good idea of the difference between these two calculations. Um, now, I did put this into Mathematica, so I'm gonna show you guys the difference between the two. So let me show you guys right here, L1 of t, let me zoom in so it's a little bit easier to see. There we go. Okay, so I'm solving the equation L1 of t is equal to L2 of t. Are these two particles at the same point at the same time? and we get an empty intersection, um, the empty set. That's just saying that the two particles do not reach the same point at the same time. So we get no solution there. That's what these open closed brackets are, or no solution. Now, uh, if we look for an intersection, that's of course also an option. And uh, L1 of t is equal to L2 of s. We're solving that equation, and we're solving that equation both for s and for t. And we get the same answer that we got by hand. s is equal to six and t is equal to negative 4. And now uh, I could check my work real easily. So all you'd have to do is plug in uh, s, or sorry, t equals negative 4, and s is equal to 6. Run that code, and you can see 9 comma 2 are the algebraic coordinates of our intersection. And the next block of code is the same demonstration that I'd already created for you guys, just showing you that the particles do not collide. What I would call this is intersection versus collision. Collision would be if the two particles are at the same point at the same time, and intersection would be are the paths that the particles trace out ever touching. That would be an intersection. Uh, they're both valid things. You guys are going to do both of them in this course. So we'll have a homework problem where you're going to have two missiles flying through the air and you want to find out if the two missiles collide in the air and explode. Um, that would be a collision, uh, and we will have situations where we're looking not for a collision, but an intersection. So you'd have to be familiar with both of them, but I put a little summary down here for you. Uh, if you solve P of t equals Q of t, that's looking for a collision of particles. If you solve P of t is equal to Q of s, that's looking for an intersection of curves. All right, moving on, let's enter the third dimension. So uh, here's going to be the idea. We are going to, instead of plotting ordered pairs, like we were in the first half of this lecture, we're going to start plotting ordered triples. 
an x coordinate, a y coordinate, and a z coordinate. And by adding on that z coordinate, um, that's our third dimension. Um, we don't just have length and width, but we have length and width and height, right? And so that is going to be um, a surface living in three-dimensional space. We know we have a surface because we have two parameters here, and we know that we're living in three-dimensional space because this is an ordered triple. So a two-dimensional surface living in three-dimensional space is what we're expecting from this particular parameterization. Now, let's back out back up a little bit. Um, I think we could probably guess a little bit of what this surface is going to look like by picking out the things that are familiar. So I'm going to scribble away some important information that I just want to ignore for the moment. If I were to scribble out the z coordinate and the parameter range for s and just look at what I have now, this would look familiar. It looks like a circle of radius 2 in the xy plane, and it looks like a full rotation around that circle. So I know that in some capacity, what I'm about to plot is going to have a circular feature to it, a circle of radius 2 in the xy plane. So we've got our 2D surface living in three-dimensional space. We know somehow a circle of radius 2 in the xy plane is going to be the basis of this surface. That just says exactly what I was describing. Um, and so now the interesting part. We need to figure out what to make of this z coordinate that is an s value where s varies from 1 to 4. Now you can see what my description says here. Um, I'm sa I said that this z coordinate equals s kind of drags our circles of radius 2 from a height of 1 up to a height of 4 along the z axis thereby making a cylinder. Um, that is true. Um, here's how I'd like you to imagine it. I don't know if you've seen these before, but um, if you were to go to Target or, or any other sort of store like that, they sell these hampers that you would put clothes into, like dirty clothes into. They're popular with college students because they're space saving. Um, basically, the entire hamper collapses down into a disc. And then if you uh, unhook some Velcro or some snaps or something, a spring comes loose and the hamper kind of pops up, and it no longer looks like a disc. It looks like a cylinder, and you could throw your dirty clothes into it or whatever, and then uh, once you're done washing those clothes and putting them away, you can collapse that hamper back down into, you know, a little disc and put it back into your closet until you need it the next time. Uh, that's essentially what's happening here. I can, I can make a visual of that for you guys, just so you could see exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, you don't need to understand this code yet, so don't worry about the code itself. But I'm going to let my circles rotate from 0 to 2 pi. You can see right here. Here's basically that, that disc of a hamper that you can buy at Target. And then you kind of unhook some snaps or some Velcro, and the spring comes loose, and then the hamper starts to pop up. And as T goes from a value of, or sorry, as s goes from a value of 1 to a value of 4, we get our cylinder. And then you could throw some clothes into this hamper and bring them to the laundry room, uh, wash your, your dirty clothes, and then when you're done with the hamper, collapse it back down, hide it in the back of your closet so it doesn't take up too much space. Now there is a difference between this hamper and the one that you'd actually be able to buy at a store. This one has a hole on the bottom. It wouldn't actually do a very good job of uh, holding clothing. And the reason is, if we were to look at the equation, uh, the parameterization for this surface, it's the lateral surface area of a cylinder. So what you can see is we have the outer border of a circle, and that outer border of a circle is lifted up from a height of 1 up to a height of 4. Um, and so it's, it's like a toilet paper tube or a paper towel tube or whatever. Um, it, it doesn't have the ends capped off. Um, you actually could parameterize a separate disk and put a you know a bottom on it if you wanted to, but this is a parameterization of the lateral surface area of a cylinder. And then finally, uh, what I really care about here, of course I want you to be able to visualize the shape, which is why I'm showing you this little demonstration here, and I want you to imagine these circles kind of being collected as they go from a height of 1 up to a height of 4, and then the collection of all of those circles gives you your surface, your cylinder. So 
visually understanding what our object looks like is important. But even more important that, than that, I want you guys to be able to write in words what this cylinder looks like. And so let me give you guys a sentence that I think is high enough quality for you know, the quiz that you'd be taking at the end of this chapter or any exams you'd be taking for the university. Um, here's a sentence that I think encapsulates all the key information about this cylinder. So first, this is a cylinder of height three. That's because it goes from a Z value of one up to a Z value of four. So that overall height is three. So it's a cylinder of height three with a base of radius two centered at zero, zero, one. This point here is zero, zero, one with cross sections, circular cross sections, parallel to the XY plane. And you guys can see that again happening here. This is just a collection of circular cross sections, a collection of circular cross sections, each of which is parallel here to the XY plane, circular cross sections of radius two, and that very first bottommost circular cross section starts centered at zero, zero, one. All right, so I hope that's that's a, a helpful example, guys. We'll do a more interesting one um, on our upcoming slides. But really what I want you guys to take away from this is this little sentence written in this blue box. I wanna make sure that you guys can reproduce that type of writing um, when you're doing problems for this course. You wanna describe all of the important pieces about this cylinder. What's nice about this answer is if, I, and let's say that your computer monitor broke and um, you know, a friend was asking you, hey, what does that cylinder look like that you plotted before your computer screen broke? Like, what, what, what are the key features of that cylinder? This is enough information to reproduce all of the important information about that cylinder. You don't need the picture anymore. A cylinder of height three with a base of radius two centered at zero, zero, one with cross sections parallel to the XY plane is all of the information you would need to reproduce that picture, even if your computer monitor was broken. And then let me just show you guys before we move on to the next example real quickly here. Here's an equivalent way to write the equation for this cylinder. So you guys can compare the given information to what just popped up in this orange box. Um, it gives you the same cylinder. The only thing I did was I separated out the portion that describes a circular cross section parallel to the XY plane with the radius of two and the centers of those circular cross sections that kind of follow along 0, 0, S. Um, both parameterizations are totally fine. You need to be comfortable enough to go back and forth between the two. Um, but what I like about what just popped up in the orange box is it breaks it down. So what you can imagine your circular cross sections are each centered at 0, 0, S. And as S varies from S equals one to S equals four, we're dragging those circles through that, that height until we've collected that entire set of circles that makes up our cylinder. So we're kind of thinking about the, the radius and orientation of the cross section in the first order triple, and we're thinking about the centers of those circular cross sections with our second order triple, and those two pieces together give us our shape. All right, moving right along. Uh, once you guys are in Mathematica and comfortable uh, running code in there, you guys are welcome to copy paste this code and try it out. It's the same little demo that I made for you guys here, so nothing, nothing too earth shattering, but feel free to give this a try if you'd like to. Um, you don't need to understand what this code is doing right now. Um, as we go further in the course, you'll get much more comfortable and, and it'll make more sense. But for now, the idea would be to copy paste that code and run it. Uh, if and when you guys are in the system and able to do so. All right, finally, surfaces of revolution. So we are gonna take a modern perspective on surfaces of revolution. We're gonna take what uh, your teacher taught you last year, and we're going to look at it again from the perspective of parametric plotting in three-dimensional space. So let's start with something familiar, and then we'll build up to this, this new material. So this is something you guys could have done last year. Your teacher could have given you um, the curve y is equal to root x, and then your teacher could have said, hey, revolve that around the x-axis um, as x varies from zero to nine. 
And I already know what you guys would do, right? You would um, go ahead and plot your curve. So here's a plot of that curve, y is equal to the square root of x, where x varies from 0 to 9. And then you probably would have drawn a little loop-de-loop -loop around the x-axis here to indicate that you're rotating about the x-axis. And then you would either have used some technology or some just hand-drawn cross-sections or even just imagining it in your head. You would try to get a visual idea of what your surface looks like. And um, since I have Mathematica available to, available to me, um, I just ran some code in Mathematica. And here is my surface of revolution. Pretty cool, right? Um, and so this would, last year, this either only lived in your brain or you just drew a couple of cross sections to get an idea of what it looked like. But now with Mathematica, you guys are gonna be able to draw some pretty cool looking surfaces. That's, that's one of your benefits of um, using the technology we have available to us in this course. Anyway, let me go back into the PowerPoint slides. I'll come back to, uh, to my Mathematica notebook in a minute, but we just sketched a picture. Uh, if you're taking a quiz where you don't have a calculator or Mathematica available to you, your sketch is not gonna look you know, this high quality. You just do the best you can drawing a couple of cross sections and trying to picture what the rest of it looks like. All right, the next thing, um, I want you to be able to describe this surface in words. If you could describe the surface in words, you can parameterize it, I promise. So I want you to imagine what's happening to these circular cross sections as we move from left to right along this parameterization. So let me try to draw a slightly better quality circular cross section here. And what I can say is the centers of these cross sections follow along the x-axis. And if we're following along the x-axis, that would be circles centered at x comma zero comma zero. And the radius of each of these circular cross sections, it varies as x varies. Basically, what, what you can see is when you're further left on your surface, those circular cross sections have a small radius. And as you move along to the right, along the x-axis, those circular cross sections get larger. And we're given a function at the beginning of this problem that kind of governs that growth. So the radius of each of these circular cross sections is the square root of x. Square root of x, square root of x, square root of x, wherever, whatever our x value happens to be at our current location. So we're gonna use that to describe the surface in words. We're gonna say this curve, sorry, that's not a curve, it's a surface. This surface has circular cross sections parallel to the yz plane with centers at x0, 0 and radii of root x. So I've covered the orientation, the center, and the radius of each of these circular cross sections that build out this surface. And you guys can see it here in this, in this illustration. We can see that each of these circular cross sections is parallel here to the, uh, the yz plane. Each of those circular cross sections is parallel to the yz plane. Um, I could show you a slightly better illustration. Uh, again, you don't have to understand my Mathematica code. I just want you to appreciate um, the fruits of those labors, which would be this little demo where I can drag a slider and show you those cross sections. So as x grows, the center of this circular cross section is at x0, 0 for whatever value of x I currently have. And then the distance from this center to my red curve, my y equals root x curve, is square root of x. So as you move along here, we can see that we had all of the important features of these circular cross sections. They're parallel to the yz plane. Um, they're centered at x, 0, 0. The radius of each cross section is square root of x. And if I scroll down just slightly further here, I can show you a labeled version of that. Again, you can see those centers. You can see the radius of, the, of this particular cross section that I currently have drawn. And that's gonna be true for whatever value of x you're at. And as you let x vary from zero to nine, it's gonna trace out that surface and give us this full paraboloid that we're expecting. Um, now we can use that to come up with our parameterization. Once you, once you know the orientation of your circles, the center of your circular cross sections, 
and the radius of your circular cross sections. That's plenty of information to get your parameterization. So let's do it. Let's translate that little sentence that we wrote into an equation. And look, this parameterization says the same things that I wrote in English above. The centers of my circular cross sections, the radius of my circular cross sections, and finally, um, I know that my circular cross sections are parallel to the yz plane. So what I've done here is I've placed cosine and sine into the y and z slots of my ordered triple. And that's going to change depending on the orientation of your circular cross section. So you're going to move those cosines and sines around depending on if you have a surface with circular cross sections parallel to the xy plane or the yz plane um, or the xz plane. Um, and then you do want to be really careful to mention the range for your two parameters. Notice here I have p of xt is equal to this equation on the right. This p of xt has two parameters, which means a, a two-dimensional surface, um, and then this is equal to some ordered triples, so a two-dimensional surface living in three-dimensional space. And it's really important when you have parameters to give the proper bounds for those parameters so you know um, what portion of your surface you're plotting. All right, and then uh, one other thing that I should mention before I move along to the next example is if you're ever taking a quiz or working on a packet or working on the midterm, if you are asked for an equation, an equation has an equal sign. So this P of XT and this equal sign are a necessary feature of the, this parametric equation. Uh, sometimes students just want to give the right side of the equation because that's the harder part to come up with. Right? That's where your brain is working real hard to come up with, with, uh, with your answer. Well, it's not an equation unless you have your P of XT is equal to. Um, we have our function is equal to our parameterization. That's going to be important, especially as we start plotting in Mathematica um, and as you're writing code to try to produce these sorts of pictures, uh, the computer is going to need the same instructions that I was just talking about. Uh, I don't want to dive too deep into the code here, but I will mention, look, P of XT is equal to, look, this is the exact thing that I had on my PowerPoint slide just written in, in Mathematica syntax, but P of XT is equal to X00 plus square root of X, my radius, times the ordered triple, zero cosine S. Um, one other question that comes up pretty frequently from year to year, so I think I'll address it now just in case you're wondering this. Uh, sometimes students want to know, hey, um, I understand why the cosine and the sine need to go in the y and z slots of this ordered triple, because I want my circles to be parallel to the yz plane, but why did you put cosine with y and sine with z? Um, could you have swapped those? And the answer is yes. Um, you could have written 0 sine of t, cosine of t, and it would have worked out just fine. Um, it'll give you the same surface in the end, at the end of the day, but what you'll notice is as t is varying from 0 to 2 pi, it's uh, the orientation of these circular cross sections, the direction that these loop around as t is varying from 0 to 2 pi will reverse and the starting point will change. But the, the final surface will be the same orange surface no matter what. So, uh, long story short, I would never take points off if you accidentally swapped these, as long as they're in the same, the correct relative positions, as long as the y and z slots have your cosine and sine, that's totally fine. Um, except for, I mean, I could imagine some rare instances where maybe it matters, but I don't see that happening during, during this first chapter of the course. All right, and then the more interesting of the two examples with surface of revolution, we're going to take the same curve, y is equal to root x. But now we're going to revolve it about the y-axis, where y varies from 0 to 2. And um, again, my advice for doing a problem like this would be to start with a plot. So we're going to do the same thing that you guys would have done in your Calc BC class. Typically, you would start with a curve. So here's y equals root x on the xy plane. Now, you guys would usually draw a little loop-de-loop -loop around the axis that you want to revolve about. And then you would either use Desmos or 
just imagine it in your head or draw a couple sample cross sections to try to picture what this surface of revolution would look like. And again, since I have Mathematica available to me, I'm gonna make the computer do it. So here we go. Here is this surface, uh, or sorry, here's this curve rotated about our Y axis. And it gives us kind of a funnel shape. It reminds me of, I don't know if you guys have seen these before. Um, sometimes you'll be at um, maybe the zoo or a children's museum or um, an arcade or something. And they have those like big funnel shaped devices that you put a quarter into and the quarter kind of spins and then falls into the bottom and then that quarter is donated to a charity. So you got the benefit of watching the, the quarter spin around the, the funnel and then the charity gets the benefit of, of having that quarter um, towards, their, towards their charity. That's what this kind of reminds me of. It doesn't really have a hole in the bottom the same way, but that's the general thing that I imagine every time I look at this, this particular surface. All right, so once you've sketched your picture, the next important part is to be able to describe this picture in words. So we want to imagine or we're going to describe in words um, the behavior of the cross sections of this surface. And if we could describe the cross sections of this surface, we can parameterize this surface without too much trouble. So I am going to write a sentence here. Um, this curve, or sorry, this surface, see I have another typo here. This surface has circular cross sections parallel to the XZ plane with centers at zero y zero and radii of y squared. Um, let me try to sell you on that idea. So first of all, I know that my circular cross sections, let me just draw a sample circular cross section here. They're following along the y axis and the y axis is parameterized by zero comma y comma zero. So that should be fairly familiar from the previous example, instead of x0, 0 for the x-axis, it's 0, y0 0 for the y-axis. Um, the more challenging part is thinking about what the radius of this cross-section would be. Now, we were given that y is equal to root x. That was really useful on the previous example when we were doing things in terms of x, and so having y as a function of x was, was useful. But for this problem, looks like I'm planning on doing things in terms of y, at least right now. So I want to take my y equals root x and rewrite that as y squared is equal to x by squaring both sides. Oh, okay, so now I have x as a function of y. And so I know that this radius here is y squared. Okay, so that's pretty good. Uh, this curve has circular cross sections parallel to the xz plane with centers at 0, y0, zero, and radii of y squared. And by the way, you can figure out uh, the orientation of your circular cross sections, in this case parallel to the xz plane, by looking at your plot um, and, and looking at how those circular cross sections seem to be drawn as you're doing your rotation. All right, so to translate that into an equation, uh, the first parameterization I'm going to show you guys, this is fairly straightforward. Now I have P of YT is equal to, here's my centers, here are my radii, here's my radius, and here are my circular cross sections. So I have um, circular cross sections centered at 0, Y0 zero, with a radius of Y squared. And you can see that these circular cross sections are parallel to the X, Z plane because the cosine and sine are filling up the x and z slots of my ordered triple. And of course, I'm always careful to give the bounds for my parameter as my parameters as well. All right, this is the easy, easy version. I'm gonna show you a different way of parameterizing that's gonna be more reliable, but it's gonna make you think harder. Um, but before I do that, let me go into Mathematica here. And I, I created a similar sort of demo for you. So I think it's probably worth just uh, dragging the slider and just making sure that we're all on the same page for how these circular cross sections are traced out. So as I drag the slider, um, it's not super smooth right now because my computer is struggling with Mathematica and PowerPoint and screen capture software running all at the same time. But you can kind of get an idea as the computer catches up. You can see these circular cross sections 
rising upward along the y-axis as y increases. And you can see that we're running along the axis, the y-axis, um, which is 0 comma y comma 0. And then we could see that these radii are growing as y increases. And if I scroll down here, I can show you a labeled version. It's probably going to be a little smoother than dragging the slider. Every time you drag that slider, it's recomputing the picture. Um, but this should be fairly stable as long as I don't move a slider around. So circular cross sections centered at 0, y0 zero, with a radius of y squared. Now, there was an algebraic, um, not trick, but an, uh, an algebraic process that was required for this to work. And that process was I needed to be able to take the equation y equals square root of x and solve it for the other variable. Right now I have y as a function of x. When I square both sides, that will give me x as a function of y. And in this case, that's pretty trivial, right? Like you guys could have done that years ago uh, without any trouble solving um, that equation for the other variable. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're inverting that function and there are cases where that's not possible. So for this particular setup, this was easy to do, but there are times that solving for the other variable can't be done. So this is not always possible. And if that's not always possible, we need some sort of alternative um, so that we make sure that we can do this problem, you know, problems like this every time. Uh, we don't want algebra to get in the way of a correct answer. So here's the other technique that we can do. We could leave this equation solely as a function of x. I changed it over to y because y was a, the more intuitive variable to work with when your cross sections are moving along the y-axis. But you could say to yourself, hey, wait a minute, this y value right here, I knew that y was equal to the square root of x. So I could have replaced y with square root of x. Also right here, I had already done the algebra on this. I know that x is equal to y squared. Well, instead of writing y squared there, I could have left it as x. So I could have put the root x in for this first y. I could have put x in for this y squared for the radius. And this would be an equally valid parameterization for this surface of revolution. And in fact, I would say that it's preferable. Preferable because um, you don't need to know how to invert the, the given function in order to come up with your parameterization. So is it less intuitive? Yes. But is it preferable? I would say also yes. Um, it's it's kind of weird because you kind of want a y value there, but that is a y value. That root x is the, the y value that we were given at the beginning of the problem. And then here, you want something that's a radius. Well, that is a radius. It's just, you know, it's kind of, we're kind of plotting this backwards by putting the x's there, but it's going to be a more reliable process. All right, guys, so that kind of covers surfaces of revolution. And let me just show you a recipe. There is a recipe you can follow for these problems. Um, I always start out by sketching a plot. So plot whatever curve you were given, then rotate that curve around whatever axis you were asked to rotate about, and you'll get your surface, right? Um, whether you're using Mathematica to do it or whether you have to do it on a sheet of paper because you're taking a quiz, either way, you're trying to get a visual handle on what your surface looks like. Next, um, you are going to try to find an expression describing the centers of your circular cross sections. Whether that's 0, y, 0, or 0, root x, comma, 0, like, you know, either of these were were acceptable for the previous example. Two examples ago, we were following the x-axis. We were using x, 0, 0, whatever the case may be. Some, um, some expression describing the centers of your circular cross sections. Now, whatever variable you go with, whether it's x or whether it's y, um, this slide says x. That's just a placeholder. Um, your particular problem will have whatever variable matches with how you're setting it up. So it might be x, it might be y, it might be z. The important part is to be consistent. So if we're using center of x, then our radii need to be radius of x. So you're going to find an expression describing the radius of your circular cross sections 
um, in terms of whatever the same variable is that you had in part two. And finally, you need to know uh, the orientation of your circular cross sections. Um, so are our cross sections um, going to be parallel to the xy plane or the yz plane or the xz plane? Um, and I said perpendicular here, but I meant parallel. So I'm catching a couple typos that I, I'm going to go back and fix in these notes. But anyway, long story short, if we are parallel to the xy plane, then we're going to put the cosine and sine into the xy slots of our ordered triple for our cross section. yz plane, fill in the y and z slots. xz plane, fill in the x and z slots with cosines and sines. And finally, we have enough information. Um, our surface is going to be fully defined by the centers of, it, of the circular cross sections, the radius of those circular cross sections, and the orientation, the parameterization of those circular cross sections. And that's it. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope this was a helpful video, and I will see you in class.